Hello all, before we begin this episode, I would just like to ask our listeners to like and subscribe to this channel as it will help us out. We are fairly new on YouTube and it would help us a lot if you did so. You can also comment if you prefer. Thank you. Welcome in the Great Khan's Tent. History, Literature and Storytelling in the Great Khan's Tent is now available on YouTube. You can find us using this podcast name. Fear not, listeners, episodes will still be released on this podcast first, and it is only after a delay of a week that I will upload them onto YouTube. You can still find us on all your podcast providers first. Are you interested in getting the book you just published reviewed? Writing some piece of literature and need help getting it out there and promoted? Interested in sharing what piece of literature we should cover next? Well, fret not. In the Great Khan's Tent is now available on Patreon, where your contribution can help in growing this podcast. For as low as $3 a month, a price less than a good, and I mean good, cup of coffee, you can help contribute to the growth of this podcast. Every bit helps, but as always, it is not necessary to do so, but will be appreciated. Find the Patreon link on our website, on our social media accounts, or email us and we can send it to you. Thank you. If you have any suggestions, comments, or complaints, please be sure to email us at all lowercase in the great Hans tent at gmail.com. That is in the great Hans tent at gmail.com. We would love to hear from our listeners. Thank you for listening, and now on with the show. In this episode, we continue with the story of the porter, the three ladies of Baghdad, and the three dervishes with nights 9, night 10, and the beginning of night 11. We also begin to learn more about the three dervishes with the beginning of the first dervish's story. The story of the first royal dervish in night 11. This section of the 1001 nights also marks the first appearance of historical personalities such as Harun al-Rashid, Jafar, and the executioner Mansur, and we will continue to encounter them in one form or another from now on. In this episode, much like the last episode, also continues the scientific wording referring to bodily anatomy. Auzubillah min ash-shaytan nirajim bismillahirrahman nirrahim In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Praise be to God, the beneficent King, the creator of the universe, who has raised the heavens without pillars and spread out the earth as a bed. And blessings and peace be upon the Lord of Apostles, our Lord and Master Muhammad Sallam and his family. Blessings and peace, enduring and constant unto the day of judgment. Of a verity, the doings of the ancients become a lesson to those that follow after, so that men look upon the admonitory events that have happened to others and take warning, and come to the knowledge of what befell bygone peoples and are restrained thereby. So glory be to him who hath appointed the things that have been done aforetime for an example to those that have come after. And of these admonitory instances are the histories called the Thousand and One Nights, with all their store of illustrious fables and relations. Shirzad continued. With every new name he produced, the girls beat him more and more, until the back of his neck had almost dissolved under their slaps. They were laughing amongst themselves until he asked, What do you call it then? The mint of the dykes, replied the porteress. Thank Allah, I am safe now, said the porter. Good for you, mint of the dykes. Then the wine had passed around again, and the caterers got up, took off her clothes, and threw herself onto the porter's lap. What is this called? Light of my eyes, she asked, pointing at her private parts. Your vagina, he said. 
Oh, how dirty of you, she exclaimed, and struck him a blow that resounded across the hall, adding, Oh, oh, have you no shame? The mint of the dykes, he said, but blows and slaps still rained on the back of his neck. He tried another four names, but the girls kept on saying, No, no. The mint of the dykes, he repeated, and they laughed so much that they fell over backwards. Then they fell to beating his neck, saying, No, that's not its name. He said, Oh, my sisters, what is it called? Husk sesame, they said, and then the caterers put her clothes back on, and they sat drinking together, with the porter groaning at the pain in his neck and shoulders. After the wine had been passed around again, the lady of the house, the most beautiful of the three, stood up and stripped off her clothes. The porter grasped the back of his neck with his hand and massaged it saying my neck and my shoulders are common property when the girl was naked she jumped to the pool dived under the water played around and washed herself to the porter in her nakedness she looked like a sliver of the moon with a face like a full moon when it rises or the dawn when it breaks he looked at her figure her breasts and her heavy buttocks as they swayed while she was naked as her lord had created her oh oh he said and he recited if i compare your figure to a sappy branch i load my heart with wrongs and with injustice branches are most beautiful when concealed with leaves while you are loveliest when we meet you naked on hearing these lines the woman came out of the pool and sat on the porter's lap. She pointed at her vulva and said, Little master, what is the name of this? The mint of the dykes, he replied, and when she exclaimed in disgust, he tried the husk sesame. Bah, she said. Your womb, he suggested. Oh, oh, aren't you ashamed? And she slapped the back of his neck. Whatever name he pronounced, she slapped him, saying, No. No, until he asked, Sisters, what is it called? The Khan of Abu Mansur, they replied. Praise Allah that I have reached safely at last, he said. Ho oh, for the Khan of Abu Mansur. The girl got up and put on her clothes, and they all went back to what they had been doing. For a time, the wine circulated among them, and the porter then got up, undressed, and went into the pool. The girls looked at him swimming in the water and washing under his beard and beneath his armpits, as they had done. Then, when he came out and threw himself into the lap of the lady of the house, with his arms in the lap of the porteress, and his feet and legs in the lap of the girl who had brought the provisions, he then pointed to his private part and said, Ladies, what is the name of this? They all laughed at this until they fell over backwards. Your zub, one of them suggested. No, he said, and he bit each of them. Your heir, they said, but he repeated no and embraced each of them. Night 10 Morning now dawned, and Sherazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. Then, when it was the tenth night, her sister Dunyazad said, Finish your story. With pleasure, she replied, and she continued. I have heard, O fortunate king, that the girls produced three names for the porter, while he kissed, bit, and embraced them until he was satisfied. They went on laughing until they said, what is its name then, brother? Don't you know? No. This is the mule that breaks barriers, browses on the mint of the dykes, eats the husk sesame, and that passes the night in the Khan of Abu Mansur. The girls laughed until they fell over backwards, and they continued with their drinking party, carrying on until nightfall. Thus they continued until the approach of night, when they said to the porter, Depart, and show us the breadth of thy shoulders. But he replied, Verily the departure of my soul from my body were more easy to me than my departure from your company. Therefore suffer us to join the night to the day, and then each of us shall return to his own or her own affairs. 
Decaturus also again interceded for him, saying, By my life I conjure you that ye suffer him to pass the night with us, that we may laugh at his drolleries, for he is a witty rogue. So they said to him, Thou shalt pass the night with us on this occasion, that thou submit to our authority, and ask not an explanation of anything that thou shalt see. He replied, Good. Rise then, they said, and read what is inscribed upon the door. Accordingly, he went to the door, and found the following inscription upon its letters of gold. Speak not of that which doth not concern thee, lest thou hear that which will not please thee. And he said, Bear witness to my promise, that I will not speak of that which doth not concern me. Decaturus then rose, and prepared for them a repast. And after they had eaten a little, they lighted the candles, and burned some ales wood. This done, they sat down again to the table, and while they were eating and drinking, they heard a knocking at the door, whereupon, without causing any interruption to their meal, one of them went to the door, and on her return said, Our pleasure this night is now complete, for I have found at the door three foreigners. They have only just arrived after a journey. They are showing the signs of travel, and this is the first time they have been to our city, Baghdad. They knocked on our door, because they could not find a lodging for the night, and they said to themselves, Perhaps the owner of this house would give us the key to a stable, or to a hut, in which we could pass the night. For they had been caught out by nightfall, and being strangers, they had no acquaintance who might give them shelter. And sisters, each of them is of a ludicrous appearance, with shaven chins, and each of them is blind of the left eye. It is an extraordinary coincidence. If they come in, therefore, we shall be amused with laughing at them. The lady ceased not only with these words, but continued to persuade her sisters until they consented, and said, Let them enter, but make it a condition with them that they speak not of that which doth not concern them, lest they hear that which will not please them. Upon this she rejoiced, and having gone again to the door, brought in the three men blind of one eye, with shaven chins, and they had thin and twisted moustaches. They spoke words of greeting, bowed and hung back. The girls got up to welcome them, and after congratulating them on their safe travel, told them to be seated. What the visitors saw was a pleasant and clean room, furnished with greenery, where there were lighted candles, incense rising into the air, desserts, fruits, and wine, together with three virgin girls. This is good, by Allah, they all agreed. Then they turned to the porter, and found him cheerfully tired out and drunk. They thought on seeing him, that he must be one of their own kind, and said, This is a dervish like us, either a foreigner or an Arab. But the porter, hearing what they said, rose and rolled his eyes, and exclaimed to them, Sit quiet and abstain from impertinent remarks. Have ye not read the inscription upon the door? The ladies laughing said to each other, Between the dervishes and the porter, we shall find matter for amusement. The newcomers apologized submissively, and the girls laughed and made peace between them and the porter. They then placed before the former some food, and they ate, and then sat to drink. The portress handed to them the wine, and as the cup was circulating among them, the porter said to them, Brothers, have ye any tales or strange anecdotes wherewith to amuse us? The dervishes heated by the wine, as for musical instruments, and the portress brought them a tambourine of the manufacture of Mosul with a lute of Al-Iraq and a Persian harp. Whereupon they all arose, and one took the tambourine, another the lute, and the third the harp, and they played upon these instruments, the ladies accompanying them with loud songs. And while they were thus diverting themselves, 
a person knocked at the door. The portress, therefore, went to see who was there, and the cause of the knocking was this. The Khalifa Harun al-Rashid had gone forth this night to see and hear what news he could collect, accompanied by Jafar, his vizier, and Mansur, his executioner. It was his custom to disguise himself in the attire of a merchant, and this night, as he went through the city, he happened to pass with his attendants by the house of these ladies, and hearing the sounds of the musical instruments, said to Jafar, I have desire to enter this house to see who is giving this concert. They are a party who have become intoxicated, replied Jafar, and I fear that we may experience some ill usage from them. But the Khalifa said, We must enter, and I would that thou devise some stratagem by which we may obtain admission to the intimates. Jafar therefore answered, I hear and obey, and he advanced and knocked at the door, and when the portress came and opened the door, he said to her, My mistress, we are merchants from Tabariye, and have been in Baghdad ten days. We have brought with us merchandise, and taking lodgings in a khan, and the merchant invited us to an entertainment this night. Accordingly, we went to his house, and he placed food before us, and we ate, and sat a while drinking together, after which he gave us leave to depart, and going out in the dark, and being strangers, we missed our way to the Khan. We trust therefore in your generosity that you will admit us to pass the night in your house, by doing which you will obtain a reward in heaven. The portress, looking at them, and observing that they were in the garb of merchants, and that they bore an appearance of respectability, returned and consulted her two companions, and they said to her, Admit them. So she returned and opened to them the door. They said to her, Shall we enter with thy permission? She answered, Come in. The Khalifa therefore entered with Jafar and Mansur, and when the ladies saw them, they rose to them and served them, saying, Welcome are our guests, but we have a condition to impose upon you, that ye speak not of which does not concern you, lest you hear that which will not please you. They answered, Good. And when they had sat down to drink, the Khalifa looked at the three dervishes, and was surprised at observing that each of them was blind of the left eye. And he gazed upon the ladies, and was perplexed and amazed at their fairness and beauty. And when the others proceeded to drink and converse, the ladies brought wine to the Khalifa. But he said, I am a pilgrim, and I am proposing to go on the pilgrimage to Mecca, and drew back from them. Whereupon the portress spread before him an embroidered cloth, and placed upon it a china bottle, into which she poured some willow flower water, adding to it a lump of ice, and sweetening it with sugar while the Khalifa thanked her, and said within himself, Tomorrow I must reward her for this kind action. The party continued their carousal, and when the wine took effect upon them, the mistress of the house arose, and waited upon them, and afterwards taking the hand of the cateress, said, Arise, O my sister, that we may fulfill our debt. She replied, Good. The portress then rose, and had cleared the table, removed the debris, and placed the perfumes, and cleaned a space in the middle of the room. The dervishes were made to sit on a bench on one side of the room, and the Khalif Jafar and Mansur on a bench on the other side. And after she had cleared the middle of the saloon, placed the dervishes at the further end beyond the doors, after which the ladies called to the porter, saying, how slight is thy friendship! Thou art not a stranger, but one of the family. So the porter arose, and girded himself, and said, What would ye? To which one of the ladies answered, Stand where thou art. And presently the caterer said to him, Assist me. Then she stood up, and set a chair in the middle of the room, opened a cupboard, and said to the porter, Come and help me. In the cupboard he saw two black dogs, with chains around their necks, 
and drew them to the middle of the saloon, whereupon the mistress of the house arose from her place, and tucked up her sleeves above her wrist, and taking a whip, said to the porter, Bring to me one of them. Accordingly he dragged one forward by the chain. The dog whined and shook her head at the lady, but the latter fell to beating her upon the head, notwithstanding her howling, until her arms were tired when she threw the whip from her hand and pressed the dog to her bosom and wiped away her tears and kissed her head, after which she said to the porter, Take her back and bring the other. And he brought her, and she did to her as she had done to the first. At the sight of this, the mind of the Khalifa was troubled, and his heart was contracted, and he winked to Jafar that he should ask her the reason, but he replied by a sign, Speak not. The mistress of the house then looked towards the portress, and said to her, Arise to perform what thou hast to do. She replied, Good and the mistress of the house seated herself upon a couch of alabaster overlaid with gold and silver and said to a portress and the caterers now perform your parts the portress then seated herself upon a couch by her and the caterers having entered a closet brought out from it a bag of satin with green fringes and placing herself before the lady of the house shook it and took out from it a lute and she tuned its strings and sang to it these verses restore to my eyelids the sleep which hath been ravished and inform me of my reason whither it had fled i discovered when i took up my abode with love that slumber had become an enemy to my eyes they said we saw thee to be one of the upright what then hath seduced thee i answered seek the cause from his glance warily i excuse him for the shedding of my blood admitting that i urged him to the deed by vexation he cast his sun-like image upon the mirror of my mind and its reflection kindled a flame in my vitals then she recited you are the object of my whole desire union with you beloved is unending bliss while absence from you is like fire. You madden me, and throughout time, in you is centered the infatuation of my love. It brings me no disgrace that I love you. The wails that cover me are torn away by love, and love continues shamefully to rend all wails. I clothe myself in sickness. My excuse is clear, for through my love you lead my heart astray. Flowing tears serve to bring my secret out and make it plain. The tearful floods reveals it, and they try to cure the violence of the sickness, but it is you who are for me both the disease and its cure. For those whose cure you are, the pains last long. I pine away through the light shed by my eyes, and it is my own love whose sword kills me. A sword hath destroyed many good men. Love has no end for me, nor can I turn to its consolation. Love is my medicine and my code of law. Secretly and openly it serves to adorn me. You bring good fortune to the eye that looks. Its fill on you, or manages a glance. Yes, and its choice of love distracts my heart. When the portress had heard the song, she exclaimed, Allah approve thee, and she rent her clothes and fell upon the floor in a swoon. And when her bosom was thus uncovered, the Khalifa saw upon her the marks of beating, as if from mikrahas and whips, at which he was greatly surprised. All the men present were disturbed as they had no idea what lay behind it. The cateress immediately arose, sprinkled water upon her face, and brought her another dress, which she put on. The Khalifa then said to Jafar, Seest thou not this woman, and the marks of beating upon her? I cannot keep silence respecting this affair, nor be at rest, until I know the truth of the history of this damsel, and that of these two dogs. 
But Jafar replied, O our Lord, they have made a covenant with us that we shall not speak excepting of that which concerneth us, lest we hear that which will not please us. At this point, the portress said, Sister, keep your promise and come to me. Willingly, said the cateress. The cateress then took the lute again, and placing it against her bosom, touched the cords with the ends of her fingers, and thus sang to it, If of love we complain, what shall we say? Or consuming through desire, how can we escape? Or if we send a messenger to interpret for us, he cannot convey the lover's complaint. Or if we would be patient, short were our existence after the loss of those we love. Not remaineth to us but grief and mourning, and tears streaming down our cheeks. O you who are absent from my sight, but constantly dwelling within my heart, have you kept your faith to an impassioned lover, who, while time endureth, will never change? Or in absence have you forgotten that lover, who on your account is wasting away. When the day of judgment shall bring us together, I will beg of our Lord a protractive trial. She then recited, If I complain of the beloved absence, what am I to say? Where can I go to reach what I desire? I may send messengers to explain my love, but this complaint no messenger can carry. I may endure, but after he has lost his love, the lover's life is short. Nothing remains but sorrow, then grief, with tears that flood the cheeks. You may be absent from my sight, but you have still a settled habitation in my heart. I wonder, do you know our covenant? Like flowing water, it does not stay long. Have you forgotten that you loved a slave who finds his cure in tears and wasted flesh? Ah, if this love unites us again, I have a long complaint to make to you. On hearing these verses of the cateress, the portress again rent her clothes and cried out and fell upon the floor in a swoon. And the cateress, as before, put on her another dress after she had sprinkled some water upon her face. The portress then rose and took her seat before saying, Give me more and pay off the debt you owe me. So the cateress brought her lute and recited, How long will you so roughly turn from me? Have I not poured out tears enough? How long do you plan to abandon me? If this is thanks to those who envy me, their envy has been cured. Were treacherous time to treat a lover fairly, he will not pass the night wakeful and wasted by your love. Treat me with gentleness, your harshness injures me. My sovereign, is it not time for your mercy to be shown? To whom shall I tell of my love, you who killed me? How disappointed are the hopes of the one who complains when faithfulness is in such short supply. My passion for you and my tears increase while the successive days you shun me are drawn out. Muslims revenge the lovesick, sleepless man, the pasture of whose patience has scant grass. Does love's code permit you? You who are my desire to keep me at a distance while another one is honored by your union? What delight or ease can the lover find through nearness to his love who tries to see that he is weighted down by care? When the portress heard this poem, she put her hands on her dress and ripped it down to the bottom. She then fell fainting to the ground. The dervishes, when they witnessed this scene, said, would that we had not entered this house, but rather had passed the night upon the rubbish mounds, for our night hath been rendered foul by an event that breaketh the back. The Khalifa, looking towards them, said, Wherefore is it so with you? They answered, Our hearts are troubled by this occurrence. Are ye not, he asked, of this house? No, they answered nor did we imagine that this house belonged to any but the man who is sitting with you, upon which the porter said, Warily, I have never seen this place before this night, and I would that I had passed the night upon the mounds rather than here. By Almighty Allah, love makes us all equal. 
I have grown up in Baghdad, but this is the only time in my life that I ever entered this house, and how I came to be here with these girls is a remarkable story. The others said, By Allah, we thought that you were one of them, but now we see that you are like us. They then observed one to another, We are seven men, and they are but three women. We will, therefore, ask them of their history, and if they answer us not willingly, they shall do it in spite of themselves. And they all agreed to this, excepting Jafar, who said, This is not a right determination. Leave them to themselves, for we are their guests, and they made a covenant with us which we should fulfill. There remaineth but little of the night, and each of us shall soon go his way. Then, winking to the Khalifa, he said, There remaineth but an hour, and tomorrow we will bring them before thee, and thou shalt ask them their story. But the Khalifa refused to do so, and said, I have not patience to wait so long for their history. Words followed words, and at last they said, Who shall put the question to them? And one answered, The porter. The ladies then said to them, O people, what are ye talking? Whereupon the porter approached the mistress of the house, and said to her, O my mistress, I ask thee, and conjure thee by Allah, to tell us the story of the two dogs, and for what reason thou didst beat them, and then didst weep, and kiss them, and that thou acquaint us with the cause of thy sister, having been beaten with Mikrahas. That is our question, and peace be on you. Is it true that he saith of you, inquired the lady of the other men? And they all answered, Yes, excepting Jafar, who was silent. When the lady heard the answer, she said, Verily, O our guest, ye have wronged us excessively, for we made a covenant with you beforehand, that he who should speak of that which concerned him, not should hear that which would not please him. Is it not enough that we have admitted you into our house, and fed you with our provisions? But it is not so much your fault, as the fault of her who introduced you to us. She then tucked up her sleeve above her wrist, and struck the floor three times, saying, Come ye quickly, and immediately the door of a closet opened, and there came forth from it seven black slaves, each having in his hand a drawn sword. The lady said to them, Tie behind them the hands of these men of many words, and bind each of them to another. And they did so, and said, O virtuous lady, dost thou permit us to strike off their heads? She answered, Give them a short respite until I have inquired of them their histories before ye behead them. By Allah, O my mistress, exclaimed the porter, kill me not for the offence of others, for they have all transgressed and committed an offence excepting me. Verily our night has been pleasant, if we had been preserved from these dervishes whose presence is enough to convert a well-peopled city into a heap of ruins. He then repeated this couplet, How good is it to pardon one able to resist, and how much more so one who is helpless, for the sake of the friendship that subsisted between us, destroy not one for the crimes of another. He recited, How good is it when a powerful man forgives, particularly when those forgiven have no helper. By the sanctity of the love we share, do not spoil what came first, by what then follows it. On hearing these words of the porter, the lady laughed after her anger. Night 11 Morning now dawned and Shehrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. Then, when it was the eleventh night, she continued, I have heard, O auspicious Shehanshah, that the lady laughed in spite of her anger. Then approaching the men, she said, Acquaint me with your histories, for there remaineth of your lives no more than an hour. Were ye not persons of honorable and high condition, or governors, I would hasten your recompense. The Khalifa said to Jafar, Woe to thee, O Jafar, 
make it known to her who we are, otherwise she will kill us. It were what we deserve, replied he. Jesting, said the Khalifa, is not befitting in a time for seriousness. Each has its proper occasion. The lady then approached the dervishes and said to them, Are ye brothers? They answered, No, by Allah, they said, we are only fakirs and foreigners. She said then to one of them, was thou born blind of one eye? No, warily, he answered, but a wonderful event happened to me when my eye was destroyed, and the story of it, if engraved on the understanding, would serve as a lesson to him who would be admonished. She then asked the second and the third also, and answered her as the first, adding, Each of us is from a different country, and our history is wonderful and extraordinary. And then they said, By Allah, lady, each of us comes from a different country, and each is a son of a king, and is a ruler over lands and subjects. The lady then looked towards them and said, Each of you shall relate his story, and the cause of his coming to our abode, and then stroke his head and go his way. The first who advanced was the porter who said, O oh my mistress, I am a porter, and this caterer loaded me and brought me hither, and what hath happened to me here in your company ye know. This is my story, and peace be on you. Stroke thy head, then, said she, and go. But he replied, By Allah, I will not go until I have heard the story of my companions. The first dervish then advanced, and related as follows the story of the first royal dervish no o oh my mistress that the cause of my having shaved my beard and the loss of my eye was this my father was a king and he had a brother who was also a king and who resided in another capital as it happened that my mother gave birth to me on the same day on which the son of my uncle was born and years and days passed away until we attained to manhood now it was my custom some years to visit my uncle and to remain with him several months and on one of these occasions my cousin paid me great honour he slaughtered sheep for me and strained the wine for me and we sat down to drink and when the wine affected us he said to me o son of my uncle i have need of thine assistance in an affair of interest to me and i beg that thou wilt not oppose me in that which i desire to do i replied i am altogether at thy service and he made me swear to him by great oaths and rising immediately absented himself for a little while and then returned followed by a woman decked with ornaments and perfumed and wearing a dress of extraordinary value he looked towards me while the woman stood behind him and said take this woman and go before me to the burial ground which is in such a place and he described it to me and i knew it he then added enter the burial ground and there wait for me i could not oppose him nor refuse to comply with his request on account of the oaths which I had sworn to him. So I took the woman and went with her to the burial ground, and when we had sat there a short time, my cousin came, bearing a basin of water and a bag containing some plaster and a small adze. Going to a tomb in the midst of the burial ground, he took the adze, and disunited the stones which he had placed on one side he then dug the earth with the adze and uncovered a flat stone of the size of a small door under which there appeared a vaulted staircase having done this he made a sign to the woman and said to her do according to thy choice whereupon she descended the stairs he then looked towards me and said o son of my uncle complete thy kindness when i have descended into this place by replacing the trap-door and the earth above it as they were before then this plaster which is in the bag and this water which is in the basin thou knead together and plaster the stones of the tomb as they were so that no man may know it and say 
This hath been lately opened, but its interior is old, for during the space of a whole year I have been preparing this, and no one knew it but Allah, and this is what I would have thee do. Then he said to me, May Allah never deprive thy friends of thy presence, O son of my uncle. And having uttered these words, he descended the stairs. When he had disappeared from before my eyes, I replaced the trap door and busied myself with doing as he had ordered me until the tomb was restored to the state in which it was at first, after which I returned to the palace of my uncle, who was then absent on a hunting excursion. I slept that night, and when the morning came, I reflected upon what had occurred between me and my cousin, and repented of what I had done for him, when repentance was of no avail. I then went out to the burial ground, and searched for the tomb, but could not discover it. I ceased not in my search until the approach of night, and not finding the way to it, returned again to the palace, and I neither ate nor drank, my heart was troubled respecting my cousin, since I knew not what had become of him, and I fell into excessive grief. I passed the night sorrowful until the morning, and went again to the burial ground, reflecting upon the action of my cousin, and repenting of my compliance with his request, and I searched among all the tombs, but discovered not that for which I looked. Thus I preserved in my search seven days without success. Welcome to the vocabulary section for episode 7. In this section, we will look at the terms and vocabulary used. First, let us look at some of the terms. Cateress, a woman who is a caterer, one who supplies what is required or desired. Rogue, a dishonest or unprincipled man. Dervishes, a member of a Muslim, especially Sufi order, who has taken a vow of poverty and austerity, noted for their wild or ascetic rituals and were known as dancing, whirling, or howling dervishes according to the practice of their order. Portress, a woman who is a porter or doorkeeper in a covenant or apartment building. Khalif, chief Muslim civil and religious leader regarded as a successor of the Prophet وسلم, ruled in Baghdad until 1258 and then in Egypt until the Ottoman conquest of 1517, held by the Ottomans until it was abolished in 1924. Harun al-Rashid, fifth Abbasid Khalif of the Abbasid Caliphate, reigning from 786 to 809 CE, known as the Orthodox, the Just, the Upright, or the Rightly Guided Khalif. Jafar. Jafar bin Yahya Barmaki was a Persian vizier to Harun al-Rashid, 767 to 803 CE. He was executed by Harun al-Rashid. Tabariye, a city on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, known as Tiberias. Khan, an inn for travelers built around a central courtyard. Mikrahas, are palm sticks. Adze, a cutting tool that has a thin arched blade set at right angles to the handle and is chiefly used for shaping wood. Basin, an open, usually circular vessel with sloping or curving sides used typically for holding water for washing. Fakir, a Muslim religious ascetic who lives solely on alms. Now we will look at some of the vocabulary. Drolleries, comical quality or amusing behavior. Repast, a meal. Carousal, a wild drunken party or celebration or a drunken revel. Rent, an act or instance of rending to split or tear apart in pieces by violence. Swoon, to faint. Covenant, 
a usually formal, solemn, and binding agreement concerneth an archaic third person singular simple present indicative form of concern protractive to prolong in time or space or to delay or defer this episode has been written edited and produced by saf big thank you for listening i hope you have a wonderful day and or night and may the journeys on which you are set upon be fruitful. Thank you for listening.